Uh, so the book of Philippians is where we find ourselves tonight. I promised a month, a little over a month ago, that we would start a series on the book of Philippians when I preached on a Sunday evening. But over the last four weeks, we've been listening to Peter Jackson from the Herald of Hope via the DVD um, that was recorded at Southern Cross. So uh, we've been enjoying the ministry of Herald of Hope, even though we haven't been able to have them visit with us and have our regular annual conference. But uh, we are moving into our series through Philippians. I preached one message, uh, an introductory message, before uh, we had that break. Uh, so tonight we start working our way, way verse by verse through uh, Philippians chapter 1. Now last time we asked and answered some questions which I don't expect you to remember. They're quite basic and simple. Who wrote Philippians? Well, that was the Apostle Paul. Of course, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Who did he write to? Well, that was the church at Philippi. Paul wrote from Roman imprisonment, his first imprisonment in Rome, around 62 AD. And he was prompted to write. Can anyone remember that? Why Paul was prompted to write to this group of believers that he loved dearly? There was a report that came his way on the lips of a dear brother in the Lord, a fellow labourer by the name of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus came ministering to Paul and with that ministry, and I suspect there was some financial and some practical care um, distributed from the church at Philippi, with the messenger came the message that there's actually some things going on in the church at Philippi and Paul felt compelled to write in response. And this is what we have, a book written to these believers. And for what purpose? Well, the truth is that the church at Philippi was struggling uh, with a loss of their joy. They had lost their joy of salvation and they were dearly loved by the Apostle Paul and this, this book is a very personal and a personal letter uh, on behalf of Paul. He, he conveys his emotions, his, his love for these people uh, very, very clearly and he speaks of himself. He, he uses the, the personal pronoun I a lot. Um, this is really him pouring out his heart towards those whom he loved in the Lord um, and he's writing because there was this problem with a lack of joy and the main point is is a call for Christians to walk in the joy of their salvation and the word joy uh, or its form is found some 18 times in the book of Philippians over just merely four chapters so it is it is used a lot and often it's obviously the overriding theme for the book. Now, there are some other sub-themes going on. That's unity in the Lord and humility on behalf of God's people. Um, but the overarching theme that Paul writes to address is the need for Christians to walk in the joy of their salvation. So today, and, and I suppose I could add to that, uh, to walk in the joy of their salvation in the midst of adversity, um, in the midst of difficult circumstances. And today we're going to jump in and look at the first well, I was going to say 11 verses, but I think we'll look at the first eight and we'll, we'll leave the next little bit for next time. Uh, we'll start with by seeing the greeting in verses 1 and 2. Then we'll see Paul's thanksgiving in verses 3 through to 8. And next time, perhaps, we'll look at his prayer for these believers in verses 9 through to 11. So that's our three main points, two of which we'll look at tonight. The greeting and Paul's thanksgiving. Before we jump into the text, let's pray and ask for the Lord to speak through his word. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God, which is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I pray that as we open it tonight and we seek to study it and perhaps better understand uh, the words that Paul wrote to this group of believers all these years ago, that you inspired him to write, help us, Lord, to, to take application for ourselves to understand it clearly and to apply it rightly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So firstly, let's notice the greeting. Uh, verses 1 and 2, I'll read those verses as we start. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, why do we have to look at the greeting? Paul says, very similar things in almost all of the letters that he writes uh, to groups of believers. And that probably should tell you something. 
it was important for him to repeat over and over every time he wrote to a group of believers. So let's look at it again. Uh, what does he say? Well, he introduces himself and his co-companion, uh, Paul and Timothy. Paul wrote, and I will remind you of that which we established last time, he wrote from a Roman prison. He was imprisoned for two years there in Rome, and we can read of the beginning of this part of his imprisonment in the book of Acts, chapter 28. We won't, for the sake of time, go there, but you can read about the circumstances from which Paul wrote. And he is writing not from a place of ease, luxury or security. Well, it was his first imprisonment, so it wasn't as bad as his second one. Well, I don't want to trade places with Paul. Whether it was his first imprisonment or his second, no one wants to be locked up. Now, there were a number of liberties attributed or given to Paul in his first imprisonment, and he was able to have people come and go, and he ministered the gospel through this time. But he was in very uncertain times, facing an uncertain future, earthly speaking. He didn't know what would be or what would be the outcome of his appeal to Caesar or, or what, would, what would transpire. He was, he was locked up under house arrest. And it's from this place that Paul instructs us about joy. It is worth reminding us that Paul is not an ivory tower theologian. He's not writing from the place of ease and comfort and security. He is writing from a place of uncertainty and he is writing about joy. When Paul was with them, this church at Philippi was probably established about 10, maybe 11 years prior. Uh, and you might be able to cast your mind back to the events which led to the founding of the church at Philippi. Do you remember um, the salvation of the Philippian jailer and his household from Acts 16? Where was Paul and Silas? They were in prison flogged and they were singing praises to God at midnight and we know the, the outcome of that. Paul to this church, he was one who suffered. When they knew that Paul was writing, they knew that Paul wasn't just sitting back and taking it easy, he was one who was suffering for the cause of Christ and when he starts writing about joy, it ought to prick up our ears and we should pay more attention because if a guy can write from a prison cell after the, the suffering that is endured in life and write these kind of words then there's some teaching for us. What excuse do we have? Right? Why do we as Christians, why are we so miserable? When Paul here is, and he's, he's writing to a church who had every reason to be rejoicing, and he's saying, well, where's your joy? Why have you missed my instruction and my example? I was rejoicing before the Philippian jailer with Silas in prison. Um, and we know also Lydia, uh, at the seller of purple, you know, Paul, when he first went to Philippi there, he didn't go to a synagogue. There was no synagogue in the city, which gave us the impression there were less than 10 Jewish men, which was what was required to found a synagogue. So they went to the, the, the river there, um, thinking it would be a place of prayer. They found Lydia uh, and the other women, and they, they went about um, ministering to them. Can you imagine the vivid memories in the mind of the Philippian jailer when it comes to those moments prior to conversion and when he first got saved and his household got saved. Can you imagine his recollection of salvation and what Paul endured for the cause of Christ? Now, Paul didn't just walk the walk, uh, talk the talk, he walked the walk. He lived out the reality of joy in the midst of adversity. And he also mentions Timothy. Timothy had a hand um, in founding the church at Philippi. But I want you to notice this. How does Paul describe himself and Timothy? He says there in verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ. Servants. Uh, that's the Greek word doulos, which means slaves. Right. Now, in this day and age, when I'm, I'm thinking about doing a little business card for the church, the amount of times people say, what's your number, Pastor? And I go grab something and I can't even find something with my number on it. So I've looked on those, those companies that do business cards and trying to get a good deal on just you know, 50 or 100 business cards. But I want mine to be the nice ones. You know, I, don't want a, I don't want a bad business card. You, know, you want the nice lettering. You want the, the, the high quality paper. Um, you want to put your best foot forward. Isn't that so typical of the Christian church? I'm, I'm speaking a little bit tongue in cheek. But isn't that the truth of the ministers of the gospel today. We want, we want to be seen. That is a far cry from first century Christianity. 
where Paul would say, we are mere bond slaves for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, we are just servants of the master. We are slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, nowadays, it's about how big your church is or how flashy your website is. And I, these things are irrelevant. Um, we are bond slaves for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think we perhaps need to get back to that mentality and mindset where we remind ourselves that what we are are simply slaves to him. Paul calls himself a slave. And a slave is one who executes the will of another. And that's the truth that we must not miss. Who does he write to? Paul and Timothy, the slave. And that's that was servants. That word is doulos or bond slave. Servants of Jesus Christ. To who? To all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. He writes to the saints. It should be established early that he is writing to believers. And that helps us when we, we go to interpret what he says. And this is not a book written to unbelievers with an emphasis on leading lost ones to the Lord. It's a book written to Christians who are saints, who are struggling in that process of growth and walking in the joy of what they have in Christ. Um, this is a book describing how to work out our, self, our sanctification, right? our, our present tense ongoing growth as Christians. The truth is there was a deficiency in their growth and they needed to follow Paul's instruction and follow his example. Paul, like I've mentioned, is writing to show how someone who is already saved can experience the joy of their salvation independent of circumstances. He writes to the saints. I find it interesting that the Roman Catholic system, there are only a few saints. And if I went to a Roman Catholic and said, oh, I'm a saint, they would consider me rude and presumptuous. I mean, because only the, the, the upper men in the Roman Catholic system can, can give sainthood, right? But that's not the Bible concept of sainthood. If you are a Christian, you're a saint. It means to be holy or set apart, holy ones, hagios, saints. Um, and all the saints, uh, all the believers there in the church at Philippi. Paul will make a tremendous statement. Turn over there, Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. A tremendous statement about imputed righteousness. See, if I'm righteous because of myself, then that Roman Catholic concept of sainthood makes a little more sense. But the truth is, I'm not righteous in and of myself. I'm righteous because he has imputed his righteousness to me. Um, and you see it there in, in verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And it's a wonderful declaration about his righteousness being made mine. And as such, in his righteousness, I am a saint. I am holy. I am set apart. I am one of his own. So he talks to the saints. And then he talks to us, uh, mentions a subgroup in the church, uh, the bishops and deacons. Um, see the plurality of bishops there? More than one pastor. More than one bishop in the church at Philippi. Interesting. More than one deacon. I have no problem with more than one pastor. Um, we see it here. So the word bishop um, is episkopos. It's trans translated overseers in other places. Um, or shepherds, it's, you know, it's talking about the pastor or the elder, the one who takes the oversight. Um, and then the deacons, diakonos, the servants. And these two offices of the church are seen very clearly here in the early part of this book. And we need to, um, and I think we already do, but we need to acknowledge these two offices in the church today. Um, the elders, the bishops or the pastors, and I use those phrases interchangeably, uh, hold the responsibility for the teaching and the spiritual oversight over the church. The deacons first established, it seems, in Acts 6 are those who serve, those who, who take care of some of the, the practical needs of the church. Um, sometimes it's in our church, they, they take the role of preaching and teaching sometimes, but they don't have to. I didn't mean you don't have to. Right? <laughs> I wasn't giving permission to deacons to say, oh, I'm not preaching anymore. <laughs> No, no, no. Um, but the role of the deacon is to take the load off the elders and the pastors so that they can better care for the needs that the Lord has called them to. That, that's what we see in Acts 6. 
and the requirements for elders or bishops and deacons are seen in 1 Timothy 3. If you would like to look there, you can, but tonight's not the time. Um, elders don't have to be sinless and perfect. Deacons don't have to be sinless and perfect, but there are qualifications which the Bible has set forth plainly that need to be acknowledged, that they need to be observed. Uh, and while we aren't expecting perfection, we do acknowledge that God has, not just anyone can be an elder, not just anyone can be a bishop or a deacon. Uh, there are qualifications established in the scriptures. But the church here obviously had them in plurality. And Paul writes to all the believers and the bishops and the deacons. And then in verse 2, this is just the greeting. He says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we need to pause sometimes and meditate on the word grace, undeserved favour from God to us. Isn't that a, a wonderful concept? Paul, nearly every letter he writes, causes his reader or his, the recipients to think very early in the letter about the grace of God towards them. And has not God been grace, um, gracious to us? I was going to say graceful. <laughs> It's gracious. You know, he's been gracious towards us. And we see that most plainly in the gift of his son and salvation through his shed blood. Grace is unmerited favour. And then he goes on to talk about peace. Grace be unto you in peace. The order is important, isn't it? God's grace brings peace. You don't have peace with God without his grace. It has to be grace first. And then we enjoy peace with God. Romans 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We in Christ, we who are saints, just like this church, enjoy God's grace and peace given from God and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We have this positional peace. It's kind of like he, he's declaring the foundation at the beginning. We have this peace. We have this grace. And then he goes through and explaining how we should experience that grace and how we should experience that peace throughout our walk with our Saviour. The experience of our peace is not the same as legal or judicial peace. And Sunday night is probably not the best time to start trying to define these things, and that's okay, but... We would acknowledge justification, what takes place when we're declared righteous by our God. And then we would understand that ongoing development in righteousness as we're sanctified. Um, and the truth is we have grace and peace as believers, but then we grow to understand more fully and experience that grace and peace as we draw near to him and as we follow the exhortations Paul gives. So we have it, but we can have a more full experience of it. You see Christians who are just overwhelmed by the grace of God and enjoy peace in the midst of adverse circumstances. They are experiencing the grace and peace which they have as a foundation in their faith. Okay, so I think that'll be made apparent as we work our way through this short epistle. Um, verse uh, Galatians 2.20 speaks about who it is that lives in us um, the piece that I'm, I'm trying to talk about, I suppose, is best could be illustrated by the peace that Jesus had when the, the storm was ravaging the, the surface of the Sea of Galilee and the disciples were fearful and crying out, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus is there sleeping in the boat you know, in the midst of the storm. And, and that is the picture of peace that we as Christians can experience. We have grace and peace but we can experience it more fully. And we, even in the storm, we can, and, and Jesus' rebuke to them was, you know, why do you have no faith? You know, why are you not believing me? Um, we can have that peace because the same Jesus who was resting in the boat in the storm is the one who dwells in us by faith through the person of the, Lord, uh, through the, person of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, Paul wants us 
who we already have peace, but to enjoy peace. He starts with this foundation. Notice how verse 2 ends, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we need to be in a right relationship with God our Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, let's move on uh, to verses 3 through 8. We've been talking about the greeting, or we could call it the salutation. Let's move on and consider in verses 3 through 8, Paul's thanksgiving. Verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Now, this is very personal. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And if you glance down at verse 7, you see also he says, I have you in my heart. And in verse 9, this I pray, uh, verse 12, but I would that you should understand there's a lot of Paul speaking on behalf of himself. All right. I thank my God. I have you in my heart. I pray I would that you should understand and so on. His, his heart is on his sleeve when he writes. Um, let's read verse 3 through to 8. Um, and then we'll come back and just work our way through verse by verse. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all, ye all are, partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in all, you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ." Paul then starts to move away in verse 9 from thanksgiving into prayer and we'll make this division here uh, just to help us understand but notice the thought flows from thanksgiving to prayer it's almost a natural progression um, but we're going to start by seeing his thanksgiving I thank my God upon every remembrance of you notice how he doesn't start he does not say send me more money and we speak kind of a little bit tongue-in-cheek here but sometimes you get that impression from missionaries <laughs> I, I know <laughs> sometimes um, it's about money first um, and for Paul it was most certainly not he's speaking about money here and he will shortly talk about their support and their their fellowship and their partaking in the ministry the same ministry and the way that they have have joined in partnership with him in the, the ministry of the gospel through financial giving so he is talking about money, but he starts off with thanksgiving. Right. And that is the best way to start anything, with thanksgiving and with prayer. A lot of Christians, a lot of us, we like to start things, but we, we often don't start in the right place. And we need to start from a place of thanksgiving for God, His mercies, His grace, and for others. And if we neglect thanksgiving and we ne neglect prayer as a foundational place, then I think we've missed some very pertinent teaching here from Paul's example. Paul begins with thanksgiving. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. He doesn't thank the God or the great God. It's his personal God. He says, my God. It's Paul is, is writing from a place of personal relationship with God himself. And that's what Christianity is. And sometimes we, we have that. You know, what is Christianity? It's about a personal relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul here expresses that when he says, I thank my God. Um, we are called to an intimate relationship with our God, are we not? We are the bride. He is the groom. Can there be any more intimate picture, earthly picture than that? And we are called to a, an intimate relationship with our God. Paul speaks from this place and then he goes on to say I thank my God upon every remembrance of you and I, I suppose he was remembering the early days of the church back those 11 years ago when people got saved and the church was founded perhaps he's remembering their ongoing support over the years and and every time he he makes mention in his mind about this church and these believers he's just rejoicing and thanking the Lord for them by the way that includes Iodius and Sintichi. 
That includes people in the church who are not necessarily doing everything right. Paul is not going, well, I, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you except for these guys who are a pain in the neck. Uh, he, he, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, I, every time I remember you, I rejoice and I praise the Lord for you. Uh, Paul knew the church was full of sinners. You know, Philippians, the church at Philippi wasn't different to the church anywhere else. I mean, we're not perfect. Neither were they. Paul is not just kind of making this up and going, wow, they're perfect. I mean, the Thessalonian church, meh. But Philippi, man, every remembrance of you, I thank my God. These people aren't super Christians. But Paul's attitude towards them is one of thankfulness before the Lord. And I think that's important as well. That should be our attitude towards the brethren here and our attitude towards other churches and other Christians and other ministries and other missionaries. We ought to be thanking our God when we make mention of them in our minds, when we remember. Paul praises the Lord. Verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. See, all is not excluding the difficult ones. He's saying, you all as a church, I, I give thanks to the Lord for. And I always in every prayer of mine for you all, making a request with joy. So he's delighting in all of them, even the ones that are harder work. The language here of his prayer, where he makes his prayer, it is sometimes translated where he offers his prayer. And there is a little bit of a hint towards the sacrificial language where you would make an offering or you would make a prayer like um, you might in the Old Testament have made a sacrifice. The Bible does speak about the, the duties of a Christian in those kind of terms, like we offer the sacrifice of praise on our lips, all right? And that's from Hebrews. Um, our good works are in places seen as sacrifice. Our, our body is to be presented to the Lord as a living sacrifice in Romans 12. So this language, though, as Christians, we don't offer animal sacrifices. We, we offer sacrifice through our prayer, our praise, our, even our good works, and even our financial giving, which is a sacrifice as unto the Lord. Um, Paul speaks about every prayer, always praying, um, I don't need to remind you that the Bible doesn't call us to pray prayers of vain repetition. Jesus, when he spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, told them not to make vain repetitious prayers. And that's very true. Like, we don't recite the Hail Mary or the, the Rosary. We, but we do sometimes fall into the trap of praying the same things and it becomes more out of tradition and routine than it is an expression of our own mind and heart and our, our desire to commune with our God. Because prayer is about fellowship with God and communing with God, talking with Him. And I think we need to be reminded that our prayers need to be thoughtful, they need to be specific, they need to be relevant. And when Paul here says this, every prayer, um, making requests with joy, reminds me that there is a prayer of different kinds required for different seasons. There is a prayer that is required when people are sick. You now in James, I think we're, we're encouraged, if any sick, let him call for the elders to come and anoint and pray, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. There's a, there's a, a prayer for those that are afflicted in James as well. There's a prayer for those that are, are merry and rejoicing and praising. So there's different things required in different places, and we need to be praying knowledgeably, intelligently, and in line with the need rather than out of repetition. Paul wasn't just mindlessly praying for these believers. It was a, an expression of his love uh, for them. And he wrote to the church at Thessalon uh, Thessalonica and he said in, in 1 Thessalonians 5 to pray without ceasing. And that doesn't mean that you just don't stop praying because you need to, you need to eat, you need to drink. There needs to be times where you're sleeping. You can't pray in your sleep. And if you tried to take that hyper-literally, how could you possibly pray without ceasing? You'd, just, you'd end up dead. But it does mean to habitually pray, to be in the habit of prayer. So I want to ask you, how worn is the carpet in your prayer closet? Is it a, is it a place you often go to? Is it a place that is well-frequented? Is your life marked by constant prayer? Uh, it needs to be. Then he speaks about joy in verse five, uh, in verse four. Uh, Always in every prayer of mine for you all making a request with joy. Um, let's move on 
to verse 5 because I want us to draw out this concept here of partnership and union in the ministry together. See the word fellowship here in verse 5? He's, he's thanking the Lord uh, for them, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. That word fellowship is the word koinonia. It, it means to be a partaker of or to participate with. And Paul is rejoicing because the Philippian church has participated with him in the ministry. They have joined with him from the beginning until now. And then we're going to skip verse 7 and jump down to verse, sorry, skip verse 6 and then look at verse 7 and 8 because verse 6 is kind of a little standalone declaration here. But verse 7 and 8 explain this even more. Even, it is, even as it is meet for me to think of this, this of you all, because I have you in my heart, in so much as both in my bonds and in the defence and con confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers, that's got the same root word koinonia there, it says fellowship in verse 5 and then in verse 7, partakers, same word, of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in all the bowels, you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Our participation, our fellowship, our partaking in what Paul was called to do. Um, what were the Philippians doing that caused Paul to have such a warm heart towards them in the ministry? What were they specifically doing to participate in the ministry of the gospel, in his bonds, in the, the defence and confirmation of the gospel? What were they doing? And the answer is that they were sending financial support to him. And that answer is seen in chapter 4, verse 16. Now, I'm sure it's not the only thing that they were doing, but this is what the commendation comes for in verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but because but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. The church got behind Paul. We, we call ourselves a, a missionary-minded church. Philippians, the church at Philippi, was a missions-minded church. They supported Paul. They prayed for him, I'm sure. They, I don't know, they adored him, they were affectionate towards him, but they also cared for his physical needs. They did this more than other churches, perhaps, that Paul had planted. They were special to him. He says, you've committed, you've, you've cared for me, you've joined with me in the gospel from the first day until now. So it's not just a one-off kind of gift, but an ongoing support that they gave regularly, and I don't know how regularly, but regularly to the Apostle Paul. Now, I find this interesting because I think this is the way we need to see our giving towards missionaries. We are joining with missionaries when we financially support and prayerfully support them. We are becoming part of the fellowship of the gospel. We are giving to them in order that we may give through them. Does that make sense to you? So we give money to the Evans family in Japan that they may give the gospel message to the people of Japan. And as we do, we support the Evans family, and we are partakers of the ministry that they are called to. It is a wonderful way, a reminder of how we ought to look at prayerful support and financial support of missions. We are partakers of the ministry. And it wasn't just in the gospel, but also in his bonds, and also in verse 7, in the defence and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of my grace. You are in fellowship with me, you are you're a participant. The word defense of the gospel, the defense and confirmation of the gospel, it comes from the word apologia, which we get the word apologetics from. Paul was one who defended the truth. He reasoned and he argued and he convinced, just like Peter exhorts us all to be in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. 
The truth is Paul was better at apologetics than any of us will ever be. Perhaps anyone at the Church of Philippi would have been. I mean, Paul reasoned with the Jews out of a Hebrew, the Hebrew Scriptures from the, the training of the Pharisees to present that Jesus is the Messiah. Isn't he open and in alleging that Jesus is the Christ. Not everyone at Philippi could do that, but they united with Paul and supported him in it. That's, we don't speak Japanese. Does anyone here speak Japanese? Kind of, maybe. We certainly don't live in the northern parts of Japan, so we can't minister to the Japanese the same way that Tony and Debbie Evans can. And I'm just picking them out of a number of missionaries. And you can, we've got so many missionaries that we need to be praying for and supporting. We don't speak Japanese. We don't live there, but we can, through them, minister the gospel as we support. Not everyone could convince the Jews the way Paul sought to. Not everyone could minister the gospel in the palace through the prison like Paul did, but these believers supported him in it. And as such, there was tenderness and love from the Apostle Paul towards them. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Now, let's just, that's a wonderful picture, isn't it? Supporting someone and, and Paul as a, as a minister of the gospel and enabling him to go forth and, and do that. And that's part of what we should be involved in. But John, in 2 John, gives us the, the other side of the ledger because the truth is we can partake in the evil deeds of false workers if we support false teachers. Have you ever thought about that? Say, so, oh, it's wonderful to support missionaries who are preaching the gospel. Amen. But what happens if we support people who are doing the wrong thing? Then we are made partakers of their evil deeds. We are enabling those who go out to preach the wrong message. Now, I'm not saying we're doing that. We don't need to look at our list over there and go, now, which one of these missionaries is Pastor Matt saying that we shouldn't be supporting? That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that we need to have the same attitude of partaking in the ministry with those who preach the gospel and the same fear of partaking in the ministry of those who preach some false gospel. Turn to 2 John and we'll read a couple of verses here just to give that context, that probably comparison. 2 John, right up the back near Revelation. 2 John, and we're going to read from verse 7. All right. I'm reading 3 John for a moment and I'm wondering why that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Verse 7 of 2 John, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. You see, that's the same word. A participant. If you're blessing those who are preaching the wrong message, then you are participating with them in those evil deeds. That's what John is warning us about. And we see that. I suppose what it, what it reminds me is that we need to be careful about who we support. And I'm not saying that I've got any concerns necessarily about those that we do support now, but I am saying we need to be searching and considering and making sure we're aware of who it is that we are supporting and make sure that the gospel that's going out is the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, not something that undermines the work of God. Now, if I was investing in a company, and by the way, this is, I get so many letters come through here to a church saying, support this and support that, and people wonder why I throw them all in the bin. Because if I don't know with confidence that that ministry is going to glorify the Lord and remain true to the Scriptures, I don't want to partake of their deeds. And there is a lot of work in researching whether an organisation is actually biblical and going to honour the Lord and not teach false doctrine. So that's why I throw most of those things out, unless they come with a very clear recommendation or they, they 
something that we agree entirely with. And the truth is that doesn't happen very often. If I was to invest in a company, I mean to buy shares in a company, I would do my research, wouldn't I? Because I don't want to invest badly in something that's going to end badly. It's even more important when it comes to spiritual things. We'll jump back to verse 6 um, just as we close. And it's, it's only really an observation here. But, but Paul here is speaking about assurance that God will continue the work that has been begun in these believers. And you could say in the context that he's speaking about their financial giving and support of the Apostle Paul. But really that's not the whole picture of what's been mentioned in verse 6. He's talking about his rejoicing and their partaking in the gospel from the beginning until now. And then he says, being confident of this very, this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now I don't think he's simply saying that I'm confident that since you've started supporting me, you're going to keep supporting me. I, I don't think that's what Paul is mentioning here but rather establishing the cause for joy in the lives of believers is this place of assurance that what God has begun, he will finish. If you come around to my place, there are a hundred jobs that are started but not finished and it is a source of much angst. <sighs> Even for me, and I can handle things half done, but it is, it is a source of angst. But I am grateful that God is not like us. He doesn't start something and then forget about it. What he starts, he finishes. And he, will, he began the work in these believers, that work of certainly redemption and then sanctification. And then what I believe is in view here is glorification, which he will continue to work in the lives of these believers until the day of Jesus Christ when he returns for his bride. So we've seen the greeting. We've seen Paul's thanksgiving. And next time we'll move through verses 9 to 11 and see his prayer. And I think six things I've observed that he prays for for these believers. And we'll kind of unpack that next time I preach. Maybe not next week because it's our church anniversary, but we'll make, it'll make sense. We'll do it when, it's, when we're back to normal. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and his heart for the church at Philippi. Thank you for the church at Philippi and their support and love for the Apostle Paul. And in this relationship between church and missionary, we see um, really some, some teaching for us, some practical reminders that, that we are partaking with our missionaries. We are in fellowship with them in the gospel and in the defence and confirmation of the truth. I pray, dear Lord, that we might see it that way and that we might be burdened with missions and that that this little assembly here at Springwood might be an encouragement to the likes of our missionaries. And I won't name them all, dear Lord, but, but you know them. And I pray that we might be a blessing to them and an encouragement in the ministry. Father, I pray that we might be effectual prayer warriors, that we might be, like Paul, quick to pray, habitually in prayer, and Lord, I pray that you would kindle within our hearts a love for the brethren uh, like the love that we see here. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.